Liam, since the last time I talked to you, yeah. you were, we put you up on YouTube and mm. something like 1,500 to 1,600 people have watched your interview. That's a lot of people. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you a few more questions, if it's okay. Certainly. yeah. And you were talking there earlier, you met Tom Barry, what was he like? Well, Tom, Tom Barry was a gentleman, mm. yeah. Tom was an absolute gentleman, yeah. He didn't, uh, certain things he didn't believe in, but then I suppose years had taught him a lot more than uh, it had taught me at the time, you know. He was great friends with Frank Ryan and that, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. but uh, I was at Frank Ryan's funeral in. Uh, White Friars Street White Church. White Friars Street mm -hmm. Church. And, mm -hmm. and the reason uh, why he went there was the fact that an old Fenian who, who would come in in Parnell's time, at uh, that time there was a, a, a hotel down at Western Row. And they brought the Fenian, the, the whole of Western Row, Pier Street was packed with people waiting on this Fenian. And uh, he came in and Parnell was there uh, and brought him all to the hotel for breakfast. And uh, he wasn't feeling too well, so he, uh, uh, Parnell said to him, let's go over and have a lie down on the couch. And uh, he went over and lay down on the couch and he died on the couch. And the Archbishop, uh, the Archbishop of Dublin refused uh, for him to be waked in the Catholic Church. I think it was Walsh, or that had been Walsh, I think. Uh, Archbishop Walsh refused, so there were, maybe it was Walsh or someone else, I don't know. So one of them, uh, Archbishops, he was the Archbishop of Dublin anyway, a Catholic Archbishop. But there's one church who did receive him, and that was White Friars Street. And that's why Frank Ryan ended up in White Friars Street. Oh, right. Yeah. After being, uh, after he was uh, brought back from Germany at that mm -hmm. time, yeah. I well, attended that uh, removal. I was at that as well. Were you? Yeah. And David Andrews was at it. That's right. He played a part in helping to bring him back. Wasn't That's he? right. He did indeed. With his sister. Eilish, I think her name That's was. That's right. Yeah. 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 Because uh, I had a relation to a marriage that was killed in Madrid, like in the, oh in the International, you know. What's his name? His name was Dinny Cody. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Dennis Cody, but they called him Dinny, you know. Yeah. And he was alongside uh, the the uh, man that run the bookstore. Uh, what's his name? Oh, Mick O'Reilly. Mick O'Reilly. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I worked with Mick later on in years in the, in the buses. Yeah. All right. But uh, Mick, Mick was a lovely man too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I remember that very well. You know. A blog called Come Here To Me put up a photograph of Liam Walsh and Liam Walsh's funeral, but the picture of Liam Walsh, he's yeah. in a uniform. He, he was dead that time. It's not Liam Walsh that's in the photograph. Yeah? That was taken after he had died. And uh, what we decided was uh, we'd have a photograph taken and uh, his face then transplants onto the photograph. So that's what happened really. Uh, I was in uniform uh, in a uh, Condon's uh, uniform as we call it and uh, we're Sam Brown, that's the one you're, you're speaking about isn't it? Yeah that's right. Yeah that's right. And uh, Cahill uh, what was his name? Holland. Cattle Holland yeah. was the photographer in 44 Parnell Square. And uh, I gave him the idea about uh, the photograph. He said, oh, that's no problem. So it was he who uh, uh, 
uh, took the, my head off and put in Liam's. And it turned out pretty good. And uh, we distributed that amongst the uh, members of South Air at the time, you know. And to a lot of people in the north. And uh, but that was that was uh, a couple of weeks after he he was buried that the photograph was taken. Okay. Liam Walsh arrived at the house, and oh, it, it was after the pillar, I think. Yeah, it was after. Of course, it was after the pillar, and uh, he came to me one night and. Uh, he said that he was going to do a job and could I explain this to him and that to him. Well, that's it. Uh, I never give people advice on this stuff unless, you know, you've been, uh, you've been trained at this sort of business. And I said, I would, because I'd be afraid another fellow would be blown up. And uh, he, we, we parted friends anyway. And, the next thing was, I got a phone call that he had blown himself up. Uh, I was asked by members of Sarah if I would take charge of the funeral, and I said I would, yeah. Because Liam and I had, uh, Liam had come in the air, into the IRA uh, not long after myself, and I had recruited him, you know. So I said I would, and I took charge of the funeral then, from then. And then I got involved in Syria. Okay. Would, could you tell me something about the funeral that day? Well, the funeral, it was the... Uh, he uh, had blown himself up and he was in uh, Amien Street in the, uh, what you call that office down there? In the morgue. Oh, in the morgue, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, uh, <clears throat> he was then, we then uh, went to 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 uh, Inchicore, St. Mike was in Inchicore, and uh, we, we gave him a 24 hour guard, you know, we, we looked after him all the, we, we never left the coffin, we had reliefs and we never left the coffin. And the next thing was, uh, when I looked, I, I was in charge of the colour party that time and I uh, saw the amount of people that attended the removal from the morgue to the, to the St. Michael's and uh, it was absolutely unbelievable. And eventually we got to Michael's, we carried the coffin halfway up to Kilmaine and went into St. Michael's where we put a, a, a guard of honour around it around the coffin and we never took it off <coughs> until we uh, brought him to uh, Mount Jerome. Was there an incident at near the GPO or something? Oh well we had a bit of, uh, we a journalist came to me in uh, just before we came to the GPO and uh, he informed me that not to fire any guns in Mount John because he said I've just left there and he said they have an army of police up there and they're all armed so he said uh, definitely don't fire any shots up there it wouldn't be worth it so I said oh that's okay we're not going to fire any shots I didn't tell him that. That's what I said to him. We're not firing any shots until we got to the GPO. And then someone in the crowd lifted the, the guns and let off let off the guns there for the guns and uh, we went up then to uh, Parnell Square. But as the gun went off and the journalists had informed me that it, uh, it was uh, would be a battlefield up on Mount Jerome. The uh, gun went off, and there was a fella beside me, a guard beside me on a motorbike, 
and he fell off the bike with a fright <laughs> because he was expecting it up at Mount Jerome. So he fell off the bike there. So eventually, anyway, we, we arrived at Parnell Square and then uh, we said, well, now where do we go from here? Because it was unplanned what we were going to do, how we were going to transport them. So I said, Cabin there, the buses. And uh, we come there, the buses, the guards agreed with it anyway because uh, they wanted us out of town. And uh, all the bus drivers drove us up and drove us to Emmett Bridge there in Harlan's Cross. And then we marched the rest of the way. And boy, it was some journey. It was a Jerry Lawless gave the oration, wasn't it? That day, I think, was it? I'm not sure what I was aiming or not. God, I'd have to check that. Yeah. Eamon didn't speak of Peter Graham's thing, did he speak of that as well? Oh, he did. He'd done, yeah. he done Peter Graham's. No, did he do mm. Peter Graham's? I thought, what's his name? Done oh, Peter Terry Graham. Galley. Terry Galley. Oh, right, OK. Yeah. Am I right? You're right on that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I, mm. I have a funny idea. It was Eamon McCann. Mm. Maybe oh, wrong. Right. You'd have to check that. And uh, I'm not sure about that, eh? but uh, everything went off well. I knew when we got in, as far as Mount Jerome, the place was absolutely packed with people, and it, I don't know many guard that was there. The place was littered with guard, but there was no trouble. I, told, I, 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 I advised everybody that they were not to take on the guard here I, because I never believed in it anyway. They were, like they were there doing the job, whatever job you were sent to do, and that was to control, I suppose, and uh, make sure we, we didn't fire any shots. But we had them already fired, mm. you know. And uh, I think it, it went back, the information went back up to Mount Jerome, you know. So they knew before we got there, the shots had gone, you know. Yeah. And then we we went in and uh, we buried them there in in uh, in uh, Mount Jerome. And uh, I don't know many thousand people were at that funeral. Yeah, I think some recently just someone said there was three thousand or more. Oh, that must yeah. be in Bower. Yeah, yeah, because. You see, what I done was, you had to be killed, I think, if I, if I remember rightly, I think it was on the Wednesday. So he should have been buried maybe on the Friday, you know, that's right. Mm -hmm. But I said, no, uh, let's bury him on Saturday. All right. Because everybody be off then, you know. <laughs> And that's the reason why he's buried on Saturday, mm -hmm. because uh, I know you know you wouldn't be putting uh, uh, people out of walk or yeah. you, know, you know you wouldn't be in confines and all that much. But it, it was the biggest and largest funeral I'd ever come across. Yeah. And uh, around that time, actually, the funeral day, yeah. or that period, did Sarah Aero or uh, interviewed, I think, with ITV. It's a clip which is shown yes, a few times. Right, I yeah, think that, you, you that might be in the picture. On. Yeah, that was yeah. later on. Which, mm -hmm. uh, Do you I remember anything about that? It, uh, I think it took place in Liam Walsh's home, his mother's home in, in Driven. And uh, because everybody was worried uh, about Sarah Erna, because uh, at that time, they they seen that they were going to do the job and not the probies, but uh, it was going on and uh, we interviewed. I think it was an interview with the ITN, was it? Yeah. Yeah, ITN. Right. I think. Yeah. Yeah, right, ITN. Yeah. I think interviewed. And then we had uh, General uh, Tom Barry involved as well in so far as that. We, we tried to get the three organisations, the officials, uh, the uh, the we and Sarah to join ranks and 
finish it off and when, when the thing was over, like, you know, to uh, sort out the political scenery then, and, you know, but uh, I brought Tom Barry with me up to uh, Parnell Square and uh, probably uh, didn't turn up, you know. And uh, the officials turned up, but not the probies. Right. Yeah. The Cathal Goon and people like that? Uh, Colin Goon, uh, uh, they, they turned up. Uh, yeah. The others didn't. Uh, yeah. Ronnie Brady, well, he was, uh, I think, president of Sinn Féin at the time. And then you had... Uh, Then you had around the IRA, they didn't turn up. Yeah, so. Tell me, yeah, when you mentioned Rory O'Brady, mm. you know, did you meet him when you were very young? Do you remember well, Rory O'Brady? Yes, I do. I, I remember him well because I, I met him the first time I met Rory was down on a campaign in Galway. And it was around the time of uh, the sentence. And, the sentences of uh, the uh, weren't he sentenced? Oh, they were sentenced. The Omar Raiders oh, were yeah, sentenced yeah. that time, and uh, I had books on uh, Clark Philip Clark, and uh, I was raising money with selling them books and that. But that's the first time I was. Rory was a student that time. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was at a, a attendant college and they were going to get a fella called Paddy Burke uh, elected to the doll, of course, on a... Abstentionist. Uh, as an, an, an extremist. Uh, yeah, abstentionist. And uh, I think that year we got four elected. Portion yeah, for yeah. were elected. Rory O'Brady was one of them, wasn't he? I think he yeah. was, and Tom Mitchell was another, maybe. Yeah. Mitchell was it. elected in the north, wasn't he? Oh, he, Mitchell and Clark in the north. N uh, Mitchell, Tom Mitchell was elected yeah. MP. Yeah. And Philip Clark was That's elected right. MP yeah. for the Northern Northern. Yeah. Uh, and then four down the south. And four in the south. Yeah. Which was pretty good for the first out, you know. Yeah. And the people knew they were going to abstain. But uh, I myself it was a waste of time. Devalier actually invited them in, like, you know, to uh, take their seats. Oh, uh -huh, did he? And, and yeah. fight the inside, you know. And he also got a great kick out of the fact when the, when the pillow was blown, he, he, he was in touch with the government. And, Telling them what they should be in the headlines and all. Is uh, Devil Air now we're talking? Yeah. About. Oh, is that yeah. right? He did. Yeah. <laughs> he 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 was. Uh, uh, oh, he was very happy that I went up. Yeah, yeah. In, well, actually, when you're when you're talking about the yeah. pillar, and I know you would know something about that. The which? About Nelson's pillar. Oh yeah. Metal concert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any stories or memories of the pillar from when you were a child, even? Well, I went up on it as, as a child. I always remember going up on it. And uh, I went, I've gone up on it a couple of times, a few times I went up on it. But uh, the, the amazing thing about about the whole effort is that uh, I, I was conceived in, uh, in early March of 1932. Uh, and it went up on March. Oh. 66. Was it <laughs> so? Uh, I'm sure my mother, uh, when she was pregnant with myself, must have walked past Pillar. Now I'm supposed to know that that's the guy who's going to have a go at me. You know, but, but that's really what happened because I was born on the 2nd of December. <laughs> so I reckon I was born. I was conceived in, the, in March, early March, which was around the 8th. 
Did your mother have some? Did your mother have some story about Nelson or something? Uh, no, she yeah. had. There was always stories going about her, but uh, that was the story she used to yeah. say to me. Like you know, <laughs> if she got into bad form at all, I always remember that uh, if someone was contradicting, you say, "Oh yeah, that'll happen when we get home." Now, you know, you know. So and this was in the in the forties, you know. Just when you're going back even years yeah. ago, could you have any other memories of the 1950s or people you would have met at that time? You know, people that, uh, like in the 50s, there must have been people that have been around in the 20s. Like you well, said about Tom Barry or all that. I met in 16, like from 60, because mm. I met Elizabeth Farrell. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, Kathleen Lynn. Mm. And uh, Grace Gifford. And how I came along to meet them was uh, I was... They never changed their mind. Yeah. They stayed Republicans until they died. There's a grave up in uh, the Republican plot and glass. And we're Elizabeth Farron there now. I don't know where Grace Gifford, she died around, uh, I think it was 59 or something. Farrell died in 57, I think, did she? She died in 57, was yeah. it? Because I know she was speaking at rallies in the 50s for the Republic. Oh, she was, yeah. yeah, and she was a lovely woman. Yeah. Because she was, when I when I seen her for the first time, I was only, what, I was like 21, I think, a little over 21, I think. And, uh, was I, I could have been 22, 21 or 22. But it, uh, when, I, when I met her, I collected her to bring her to uh, to some function uh, to raise funds for the prisoners. And uh, I collected three of them, Dr. Kathleen Lane, uh, Elizabeth Farron and Grace Gifford to three of them. And when she got into the car, I could not believe it because she was dressed in a sort of greeny tweed with with a with a hat, you know that uh, you'd see in the films now. Like, you know, she she was a powerful looking woman, yeah. you know, and uh, she to me now they were three three ladies, like you know, they they were beautiful. But then I also met uh, the man who walked with James Connolly up to the GPO, a man called Frank Rowland. And I met him through the union. I've met a couple of people like that along the line, you know. And uh, it's like, uh, what's his name now? Did you ever hear of a fella called Dan Keezy? Yeah, yeah. from Did County you? Kerry. From Killarney. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I met the, <laughs> Dan, right? He lives to be over 100. He died only... He died 105, I think. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, the amazing thing about that, I was up in a point uh, in the Liberty Bell in Francis Street. And this man arrived at the bar with me and called a pint I think and I called a pint and for some reason or other he started chat and he, uh, when he started chatting he, uh, I knew immediately he was uh, a Republican because of his, uh, his political sort of talk like you know he was on about 22 and 16 or I said, I, I was saying it's a long time ago, and he was saying, oh, I was in 16. And I looked at him because Dan Keaton didn't look, to me, didn't look 70. So the next thing was, uh, we had another point, and uh, then he sort of knew then what side I was Oh, and so when he says, gee, he says, uh, you, know, you, you, you know your history. I said, I do, yeah. But I said, I'll tell you one thing. You weren't in 16. Because he didn't look the, 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 the age, mm -hmm. you know. And he says to me, yes, I was. 
I say, your age. And he said to me, how old am I? Well, I said I'd put you down early 70s. So he laughed and he said to me, I'm 95. God, he lived 10 more years. He did. Mm. And he died 10 years later. Mm. Yeah, he was uh, 95. Either 95 or 97, he told me. One of, one of those ages. <laughs> I said, you couldn't be. He says, I am. And he was also, I think, Secretary General of the Fitness Association. Because he was a barman in that's Dublin right. all his life. That's why he was a barman, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So he told me all this anyway, and uh, we had the rains to meet again on the, f the Wednesday. This was on a Monday. It was on a Monday. And I said, I'll meet you here Wednesday. And I arrived in the Liberty Bell on Francis Street. And I met. I did meet, we never turned up. So I didn't know what happened. Nothing happened. And the next thing, I I had forgotten all about Dan. But I was telling the story about Dan to loads of people. Yeah. And I was telling it in uh, in a bar in town called Grogan's. Oh, yes, yeah. And I was talking to Tommy Smith there. And uh, he knew him, he knew him very well. But this old man uh, sitting down having a pint said, I, I know him, I knew him very well. He said, I worked for him. And uh, he told me, well, I said, I, I made the pint of me and we didn't turn up. He said, if he didn't turn up, there must be something wrong, you know. Because once he'd say, I'll turn up, he should have been there, you know. But anyway, I didn't meet him again. Until uh, the BBC was doing something on, on the pillar. And I was being interviewed with this journalist. And the journalist, anyway, was, he had done something and... The next thing was he rang me uh, one night, <coughs> late, and said, Liam, you won't believe this. He says, the wind that shakes the barley, the film, he says, the directors decided they'd send um, a limousine to Canary to collect this man. Ken Loach, the director. That's director. Right. Yeah, yeah. That made the film. Yeah. Directed that uh, this limo should go to Canary and pick up a man there right. called Dan Keezy. Right. Yeah. See? Now it never hit me. This is, this is now seven or ten years later. Yeah. You know, uh, it could be 97, that would be mm -hmm. three, uh, yeah. four. I'd say about seven years, maybe six or seven years later. Like, whenever they, they, they were shown it in Cork, the, the premiere was in Cork. So I said, oh gee, and I say, how old is he? He says, he's 104. Yeah. Wouldn't that take the limo? Why would he take the limo? He says, no, 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 no. He told me he would get a bus to Tralee. <laughs> no, he says, he's 104. He'd get a bus to Tralee and he'd get the train from Tralee to Cork and they could pick him up in Cork. Now, I said, 104, you must be joking. Oh, he says. I remember reading in the paper, he said, yeah, I know he was walking to the cinema. I remember reading this thing. But right. He, I don't believe at his age. So yeah. the next thing was, uh, I put down the phone. And I was sitting there, I don't know, I, I probably sitting there watching television. And uh, I said, Dan Key, that rings a bell. 
and it was the man I met in the Liberty Bell. Mm. Seven, say years previously, the man that never turned up, and uh, he was from Killarney. <laughs> yeah. I only realised it when I sat down. You know, actually the. The farmhouse that they use in that film, where the rebels lived. Yeah. My father was born in that house. Oh, you're not yeah. serious. So, yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's the one with Dan Keaton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down there uh, after, and uh, I'll go back again and uh, put a, a read on, you know, on, on the grave. And he never changed his views, did he? Never. No. Wouldn't take. He got his pension, right? They offered him his pension and he wouldn't take it. And then, I think it would have been McAleese or Mary Robinson was the president, sent him a cheque <laughs> for two and a half thousand <laughs> and he sent it back to her saying, You're too friendly with the Queen of England. Mm -hmm. That's right, it must be Mary Robinson yeah. because... Yeah. Uh, I think it wasn't Joe Clark, you would have known him. He was the same, he didn't, uh, wasn't it? No, he did, yeah, he Joe. He didn't collect a pension, he said he was still on active service. Yeah, Joe, <laughs> I knew yeah. Joe, yeah. Well, I lived in the yeah. tenters there. Yeah. And uh, he... He was, phoned the Rising, didn't he? Mount Street Bridge. He, he was at Mount Street, yeah. under Captain Malone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they used to, they used to, uh, they put a nickname on him. Uh, the nickname was uh, Duck the Bullets. Because they, they fired a few shots on him and he ducked mm. and he missed them. And uh, they decided that he wouldn't shoot him, you know. Because the, the, the officer in charge uh, of the British, uh, as they came down Northampton Road, uh, it's Northampton, isn't it? Yeah, that's Northampton Road, I think. Yeah, the, the one that, if they had to gone the other way, they, they, they'd have made it. But they did make it, they came down and, and uh, Joe was there in the school. That's right. And uh, it was, there was only a handful. They were under the command of uh, De Valera. Oh, right, okay. Because uh, he, he was in charge of uh, that Boland's Bowling Mill and that right. like, yeah. yeah. So that, and that was that, yeah. Sorry, Liam, yeah. you, you were saying to me there yeah, about no, Daniel O'Connell. Uh, Daniel O'Connell, yeah. yeah. But uh, we, do you know, uh, I knew this guy, he was a great storyteller. And he told me one time that I, I wouldn't be in uh, O'Connell's band because I'd be of a different, uh, of a different uh, beliefs. You now he'd uh, like he'd be different to Pierce, and so I never talked to O'Connell in any way. Like you know, but uh, I heard a story about uh, these two guys. You know, they're going at the time at the carriage. A horse and carriage, and they were going down the country to uh, down to Cork or somewhere. And, uh, they arrived at at an inn halfway down, and they pulled in to get a meal and a bed for the night. You know. And uh, after they had a meal, and they asked the innkeeper, "Would he ha have a, a deck of cards? They could have a game like before they went to bed." But uh, the gamekeeper put his hand up and took down the deck of cards and gave them to him, you know. And uh, they were playing cards there and they started to bet money down, you see. And, but a row developed in the inn. And then one of them whipped out a pistol and shot the other fire. So. Yeah, man, seen the action. You know, he he was there when the action was going on. Uh, your man was arrested and placed in in, in prison. You know, 
and uh, he engaged Dan O'Connor to defend them, you know. So Dan said, uh, he was explaining it to Dan, he says it went in, he says, an open shutting, going to go all of this one, you know. He says, and they shot him. Uh, did anyone see it shooting? Or, or, but, yeah, the innkeeper, he says, see, see me shooting him. And, he's, uh, and he says, I don't stand a chance. You know. But you leave that to me, he says. And uh, he went off. I'd be back down to see him. So he went went back to Dublin you know, a few nights after. His junior and Dan got on the same coach. Had it down to the same inn in the country. And he went in, ordered the mail, and they were staying the night. Well, that's a great span, the innkeeper. So he went in anyway. That time, of course, Dan used to wear the big cloaks and all this. Year. In he went with his junior anyway. He had the mail and he said to the bartender, you, you wouldn't have the deck of cards. He said, uh, before we go to bed, we're wondering, oh, see, I, I wouldn't loan cards to anybody now, he says. Why is that, he said. Oh, he says, two men came here, he says, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, he says, and uh, I gave them the deck of cards, like, just like what you said. Uh, hand me down the cards and he gave them the cards, he said. They start back in money, he says. And one fella lost, lost the cool, he says. And, uh, fired and killed it, the other fella. So you, they're, they're going to hang him, they'd be hanged in Cork, I, I say, in a couple of months, you know. Oh, yes, says Dan, I remember that case. Well, he won't hang. Well, your man says he will hang. Not sure. There's no witnesses around. Oh, he says, I'm no witness. Hey, he says, yeah, he says, sure. I seen him shooting him. He says, he's definitely going to hang. Oh, no, no, I'll just, I'll come. They've a row off on money and he was pointing out different things to uh, about the, the two men sitting down and this could happen and that could, he says, uh, he, he'd he probably get a, a few years or something, maybe. No, says your man. Your man got very serious. He says, I'm telling you, he's got to hang for this. So O'Connor removed £10 from a wallet and said to him, I bet you £10 he doesn't hang. You're wrong. And your man put a tenor on top of it. The innkeeper. And of course the court ca it went the case went to court. And uh, your man has been prosecuted for the murder until Dan gets up. The cross examined. And he says, uh, you did you see this? Of course, your man didn't recognise him kind of at this stage. He says, did you see this happen? Oh, I did, he says, yeah. And he said, uh, you seen him actually shoot him? Oh, I did, yeah. But is it not true, he says, that you're going around placing bets that he's going to hang? George had to throw out the case. But that, that was Dan O'Connor, you know, he, he got up to every trick. I say he was a good lawyer. What? A good it's lawyer. A good he was going up Lord Ever Street one day and there was a fella digging a hole, you know. And Dan is up for election. And he's, yeah, man says to him, hey, do you think he'll win the, 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 the election, Mr O'Connor? Well, he says, whether I do or not, you'll be still, still digging a fucking hole tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>
What do you think? I think it's fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Liam. Right. We'll come back to you again after this one has a, about 1,500 views. <laughs> <laughs>